Okay, this is the fifth video in a series of videos explaining how polio is a man-made problem. Make sure you go back and watch the other four before you start this one. We've shown how injections and tonsillectomies can cause polio to paralyze in a geographically correlated area. But provocation polio from injections and bulbar polio from tonsillectomies were the exception and not the norm. How did the polio virus do most of its damage? If you go look through all the medical history books, they might explain how the polio virus replicates in motor neurons or damages the motor neurons, but they will never tell you how for sure a fairly innocuous virus like polio started to make its way into the nervous system. They will say, the molecular mechanisms by which polio virus causes paralytic disease are poorly understood. The reality is they don't know why. But luckily for you, I think I know why. And it tracks back to all of the lead arsenate, Paris green, and later on the DDT that was coating our food, our water supplies, and our bodies. These pesticides are known neurotoxins and could cause paralysis that they thought was polio. But that wasn't the central problem. That was just a sideshow to the main stage. Let's look at how the most common cases of paralytic polio arose. A young child, seemingly healthy one day, wakes up the next morning and can't move. They have paralysis, typically in their lower limbs, their legs, sometimes their arms. They can still feel things with their legs and arms, they just can't move them. This is important. It's why polio was originally called acute poliomyelitis of the anterior horn. Anterior refers to the front half of the spinal cord, the part that controls movement. This new paralysis people started seeing in the late 1800s was strange because you didn't lose touch or sensation, only movement. If you were in a bad accident and broke your back, you might lose movement and touch because your entire spinal cord had been damaged. With this new phenomenon, it was just movement, not touch. It only affected the front or anterior part of your spinal cord, not the back. Why? Geography. Geography. Shot here. Paralyzed here. Tonsillectomy here. Paralysis here. Remember that. The books will tell you that poliovirus gets into your blood and sometimes, for reasons unknown, will make it into your bloodstream, into your brain, past the blood-brain barrier, into your spinal cord, all the way down, not paralyzing anything along the way, until it gets to the bottom of your spinal cord, where the poliovirus will then infect the motor neurons at the bottom, the ones that control your lower limbs. And here's the kicker. Only the neurons on the front of your spinal cord, the ones that control movement, not the back of the spinal cord, the neurons that control touch and feel, just the ones at the front. I don't know about you, but this pseudo-explanation seems completely ridiculous to me. I can't believe it. It's just not plausible. I kept going back to geography. Remember that the poliovirus is an enterovirus. It lives in your gut, usually without any problems. Let's look at some anatomy here and look at the geography of where the intestines sit and the location of that section of the spinal cord that controls the lower limbs. You know, the body part that typically gets paralyzed from polio? Are you starting to see it yet? We're fairly certain that some paralysis attributed to polio was due to the pesticides themselves. We know that the poliovirus can wreak havoc on the nervous system, but it never gets into the nervous system without an injection or tonsillectomies or one other thing. Pesticides like lead arsenate and DDT have a very interesting and very horrible feature. They wreak havoc on cell membrane function. They can make them permeable. Do you see it yet? When you get a poliovirus infection, it replicates into massive numbers in your intestines, massive amounts. But again, nothing to worry about because there's no way it'll ever make it into your nervous system unless you're ingesting pesticides that break down the cellular membranes in your intestines and adjacent portions of your body.
giving the poliovirus a portal into that specific part of your spinal cord, the part that controls your legs. The poliovirus could damage any of your neurons, but remember, it only seems to infect the front part of your spinal cord, the part that controls movement, never the back part of your spinal cord, the part that controls touch and feel. If the poliovirus was affecting your nervous system because it was traveling through your bloodstream, how does it miraculously avoid the back half of your spinal cord every time? How does it miraculously avoid the top half of your spinal cord every time? Your entire central nervous system is served by the same blood vessels potentially carrying the same poliovirus. Yet most of it never has a problem during a paralytic infection. Just this one specific part, the front half, the lower section, the part that lies adjacent to your intestine, the exact part of your body where millions and millions, if not billions, of poliovirus are thriving. Every time you get down to brass tacks, there is confusion and wild speculation. Scientists don't know why the poliovirus started paralyzing people in the late 1800s. Some people will suggest improvements in sanitation had something to do with it. That might have affected the frequency at which you encountered the poliovirus, but it had nothing to do with whether the poliovirus would paralyze you or not. Some will suggest that poliovirus in the blood was somehow able to migrate into a very specific part of the central nervous system, while magically avoiding all the other parts. But even if this were true, why now, and not the thousands of years before? What changed? Three polioviruses simultaneously? Some people will suggest changes in breastfeeding habits made infants more vulnerable to polio infection. But again, this would only affect whether they had a mild or severe infection. I would argue that infants without their mother's poliovirus antibodies to help them would have a more sustained poliovirus infection, and this did increase the odds that enough poliovirus would be able to make it into their nervous system to paralyze but you still need a path, an injection, tonsillectomies, or permeable gut membranes. This is why a formerly innocuous virus began to paralyze people. It wasn't a sudden change in the human genome. It wasn't a sudden change in the virus. Starting in the late 1800s, specifically in 1892, two years before the first recorded polio epidemic in the United States, we developed a new type of pesticide that wrecked people's intestines and provided a way for a harmless virus to migrate into their nervous system and cause bad problems. Without that pesticide, lead arsenate, and later DDT, you and I would probably have never heard of polio or a polio vaccine. It would be an obscure condition that popped up once every few years during the summer when a bunch of kids got their tonsils taken out, or in the fall when kids were getting their shots for school, but nothing more. Polio is very clearly a man-made phenomenon. But if you still don't believe me, I've got one more episode in this story that I think may convince you. A very curious sequence of events that was what finally convinced even me, a natural-born skeptic, that we were in fact the cause of polio. Polio.